So keep these things in mind as we proceed. The objective is that we can transparently provide what we have done in the method section, supported by additional information in appendix and a figure one in the results section. So here we take PubMed as an example. If you log into PubMed, you are able to save your searches. And uh, if necessary, I will aim to show you live some searches on one of your questions uh, that, that, that you may want to bring forward for consideration. So if you think about how PubMed works in the background, you have the chance to add all your search terms. And then you have also the chance to think about how you want to combine these terms using and or or. or uh, item population within the structured question. All of these terms are combined using the, 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 the Boolean term, or Boolean uh, <coughs> uh, term or. Then, a separate set of terms is created for tests and they are all combined with or. And a term set is created for outcomes and they are all combined with or. And in order to put all of this together, each of these sets is combined with and. And this is how you get the final search term combination which can be further refined according to the number of citations you have obtained. We can return to this slide, uh, depending on how uh, this discussion pr progresses. But the point here is that this type of detailed information concerning how terms were identified and combined need to be summarized in somewhere in the paper, usually there isn't a space in the main manuscript, and this detail can be provided in appendix one. And figure one, which need to be presented in the results section looks something like this. Here you have the terms for population combined with or, and this number in this particular review exceeds 21,000. The term for tests combined with or for history, examination, and other investigations altogether, you can see a very large number over there. And for outcome, again, very, very large number. But these terms are all combined with and, and ultimately after excluding animal studies and other such that are not relevant to our question, we have over 11,000 citations at the bottom of the figure. This information need to be presented as figure one in your published paper. So at this time, I'm going to take a little pause and leave for you to ask me any um, questions or any clarifications you wish uh, to address. Does it all sound too difficult or too complicated? Oh. 
Well, you, you are all quiet. So do I presume it is? Ah, okay. Eva, Eva, uh, Eva, I hope I've got your name correctly, says no, it does not sound too complicated. So, well, uh, Maja also says that you have understood it well. Okay, I'm going to put one of my own questions to you. And my question is, can there be a review published without any studies selected? What do you think? So Costa thinks, well, Costa says no question mark. So you are unsure whether there can be a review if there are no studies on the subject. And uh, Mitya asked me if there are no studies on the subject. Yes, that is my question. There are no studies suitable for inclusion in a review. Can such a review ever be published? Maja says no. Any other? It would be a review of opinions. I mean, Urska makes this comment. Um, sure, it could be a review of opinion, but it could also be a review of the fact that no studies exist. Is that not possible? Ivo says true. I presume you mean yes, it is possible that there could be a review published which factually confirms that there are no relevant studies. Do you think, but I, I presume you know that British Medical Journal or BMJ is one of the top journals in our specialty, right? Do you think a big journal like the BMJ could be convinced by authors to publish a review that has zero studies? Eva Uh, text taken from a paper published in the BMJ. You can see the title. It's talking about impact of signs and symptoms, diagnostic impact of signs and symptoms. Uh, and it's a systematic literature review. And here, if you look at the details of the search, which they have presented here in um, form of a table, they identified nearly 7,000 citations, of which nearly 3,000 were duplicates or on other topics and were removed. And uh, after application of the various uh, criteria, in the end, they were left with just one citation. And as it turned out, when they applied quality assessment to examine whether this study is worthwhile, the conclusion was that this study is methodologically not sound. So here you have it, a systematic review published in the BMJ with zero studies included. Uh, Mitya says, yes, 
It can be published if it is by well-known authors. Martina says, probably not, but maybe a specialized journal might be persuaded. Well, Martina, you can see that even a big journal can be persuaded. And do you know any of these authors? And how do you determine that an author is well known? Well, I'll leave you to think about, uh, about this. Um, and you and Mitya has noted it very well that this was 2002. So it could be that in today's world, 20 years later, it may prove difficult. What, Mitya? If you are undertaking your own study and you need to justify that uh, your study has merit, it should be carried out. One of the justifications for carrying out a new study is to demonstrate that no previous such study exists. And such a justification may be provided via carrying out a literature search, which ultimately shows that ex studies do not exist or the ones they ex that exist have some weaknesses. I guess my objective is to demonstrate to you that in an important research question, if you use the correct methodology for framing the question and searching the literature, and if you find zero or very few studies, this is itself a worthwhile scientific exercise that can be taken forward for submission to a journal or be used for inclusion in justifying the need for a new study, uh, which is normally written in the background section of a paper. Evo says, can we still call it a review or is it just a literature search yielding no true results? Well, I suppose the literature search did not yield any result is the correct, correct description. But in order to get to this stage, you had to go through the first two steps of a systematic review. So it, think about it. It is possible that somebody commenced a study. There are many such examples where following ethics approval, the study was started. The sample size requirement could never be met. Very few patients came forward. Just have a very small study. So this type of um, termination of a planned systematic review is similar to a small study that is the result of failure to recruit the required number of sample size. Okay, so we're coming to the end of the first 40 minute session. I'm happy to remind you that my idea here is that if I can help you prepare your review in such a way that when you submit it, it can be accepted in the first go, then I will be a happy teacher because my students uh, succeed in getting published. And one of the key steps in getting published involves writing the justification for your study or writing the justification for your review. So
So in order to show you some examples of how literature searches can be used to strengthen your, uh, your submission, I'd like to take you through um, some examples. So in the background section of any paper, the important things to write are the importance of the topic, the justification of your study, and your own hypothesis. So the hypothesis that you write in the objective of the abstract which covers the participants intervention outcomes uh, of your framed question along with the study design all go into the third paragraph of the introduction section the introduction section is not a book chapter uh, the expectation is that the introduction section will be no longer than one page of double spaced typing in the word file, i.e. no more than four or 500 words. It will have only two or three paragraphs. The third paragraph will be the description of your objective along with your study design. The background will include importance of the topic concerning disease prevalence, life quality, economic aspects, patient priority with respect to the topic you are covering. And I request you to consider citing these aspects of the topic backed with references that are systematic reviews. So for example, you look for a systematic review of disease prevalence and then just cite that reference in writing this first paragraph. And same applies to other aspects of importance of the topic. And then there is a question of why was your study undertaken? For this, you need to demonstrate that no such papers exist. And the previous example of the literature search that I showed you allows you to imagine in your head that if you had such a search, to back your claim that no papers are... uh, We now have just a couple of minutes left. So in, uh, instead of going into detail, I'll suggest two other possible justifications. One justification is that the existing studies are of poor quality. And a final justification can be that good existing studies need repetition. Considering um, these three possible justifications, um, I remember at least a couple of questions from yesterday. Uh, one question concerned use of fluoride for prevention of caries. Another question concerned development of a mobile app for examining the outcome of breast reconstruction. And uh, there may be other questions that people have thought about since yesterday. Uh, my request is for you to 
undertake some searches on your topics over the next uh, 10 minutes or so and then be prepared to talk about this when we return in order to highlight why your study is justified and that uh, this information will be useful to you in writing the background section. So with this, uh, we bring the first session to an end.